fault tolerant computing and today's topic is um, one of the most important concepts in this uh, in this area and it's called atomicity and what we're going to do is spend time um, understanding what this is as a concept and then understanding how to achieve um, atomicity in, in uh, systems and recall that the main goal is to handle failures and that's what we talked about uh, the last time um, and we came up with a bunch of different ways of thinking about failures and how to cope with it. And one idea that we saw the last time was an idea involving replicating a component, um, let's say a, you know, a disk or um, a, a, any um, component that you wish to, uh, whose failure you wish to cope with and vote on the results. And so the idea is that um, if you're not exactly sure what the right answer should be, uh, if you're not sure uh, whether any given component is working correctly or not, replicate that component and then give them all the same input, see what output they produce, and then vote on the results. And, we turn it, and, and we did see that these things are pretty sophisticated. But the main problem with replicate plus vote is that often it's extremely expensive to build or very, very hard to get right. Um, and second, uh, it often doesn't actually work. For example, uh, if you just take um, a software program, a software module, and you, know, you make 100 copies or 95 copies of that software module and give them all the same input and then vote on the outputs, if you have a bug in one of the modules and it's uh, a bug that's actually replicated in all of the modules, then all of the replicas are going to give you the same wrong answer. So the key assumption behind replicating and voting is that the replicas are independent of each other and have independent uh, modes of failure, and that may not be true um, in all of your modules. And so the way we're going to deal with this problem, and even though it's possible to design software systems where the replicas are, in fact, independent of each other, uh, it'll turn out that it's ex quite expensive to do uh, in many cases. So what we're going to do is to relax this assumption of having a system which uh, uh, handles failures by uh, giving the same input to multiple outputs and then voting on it, we're going to relax that and instead look at a different concept called recoverability. And the idea here is rather than to try to build a system uh, uh, to replicate modules so that to the higher layers it looks as, as if the underlying module has never failed because you've replicated it, um, the idea here is to allow the underlying module to fail, but have it fail typically in a fail fast manner so that you can detect the failure and then arrange for that module to be restarted. And when it restarts, the idea is to make it so that module does something such that in the end, you know, uh, the state of the system after it does that thing, usually some kind of a recovery procedure, is that um, you can get back to using that module. So it's a little bit like, rather than try to, you know, build, you know, the analogy might be something like this. Uh, you might imagine, let's say there's a little child who's learning to walk. One approach for nature to have adopted would have been to try to make it so the child never falls. And there's a lot of complexity associated with always keeping that child walking. Or alternatively, you could have a story where, or, or a method by which every once in a while the child falls, but then has a plan to wake up, to get up from that fall and then restart. So that's the plan that we're going to adopt. And this notion here um, is called recoverability. And the general plan is going to be that if you have a module M1, which invokes another module M2, and M2 were to fail, then the idea is that M2 fails and then it recovers. And you restart the module. And you want to make sure that M2 is left in a, in a situation once it recovers where there's no partial state. And I'll define that more precisely when we, as we go along today. But the main idea is going to be to ensure that there is no vestige of previous computations that are in the middle of being wrong. So the state of the system when it recovers is at a well understood point so that M1 can continue to use that. So there's no partial state where partial uh, is in quotes here and we'll, we'll talk about what it means for something to be in a partial state. The idea is to prevent that from happening. So we're going to do this by uh, starting with an example, and the same example that I mentioned the last time, which was a transfer of money from one bank account to another. So there's a from account, there's a to account, and some dollar 
amount and you want to transfer money from from to to and it's whatever amount is. And the problem here is, of course, that um, in the middle of transfer, this procedure might fail, it might crash, the system might crash, and you might be left in a situation where um, a part of this transfer has already run. So to take a specific example, here's an example of what the transfer procedure might look like. Um, so it takes a from and a to and an amount, uh, and the first thing it does is to read from disk. So assume that all of this data is stored on disk. Um, it reads from, you know, from the from account, and then it reduces that, debits that amount, uh, debits the amount from that account, and then writes back. And it does the same, same thing to the to account. So in the end, if this procedure completely ran, then uh, from account would be reduced by amount, and to account would be um, enhanced by amount. Of course, the problem is you might have a failure anywhere in the middle. And as a concrete example, if the failure were to happen, if a crash were to happen after the first three lines shown above, um, if you owned this account, you wouldn't be very happy because you just lost some money from an account and nothing happened. Right? No, no, other, no, no other account got money added to it. And this is the problem that we want to avoid. So if you think about this for a moment, what you would like intuitively is that if a crash like this were to happen, and the system were to recover and come back up, there's really only two states that the system should be in for the system to really be correct and to meet what your intuition might expect. Either this procedure must completely be finished, that is, the state of the system must be the same as if this procedure completely ran and finished, or the state of the system must be such that the procedure never ran at all. It is not at all okay. It's not okay to let the state of the system be um, equal to whatever the state was at the time, in this example, at the time the crash happened. So what you want is a kind of all or nothing behavior. Now, of course, if the crash happened as I've shown it here, there's no way for you to have prevented those lines of code from being wrong, right? Those lines of code ran and then the crash happened. So what you really need is a way by which you can back out these changes. The, what the system needs is a way by which when the system crashes and then the, recovers from the fault, from the crash, um, during failure recovery, the system has to have a way to back out of whatever changes it's made. In other words, what we want is a concept called recoverability. So a more precise definition of recoverability is shown on this slide. And let me just read it out. Um, a composite sequence of steps, which we're also going to use the word action for, an action is recoverable if, from the point of view of the module that invokes this action, this sequence either always completes or aborts. That is, if it fails and then it you know, backs out, aborts in a way such that it appears that the sequence, that sequence had never started to begin with. And in particular, what this means is that if a failure were to happen in the middle, when the system recovers, um, it better have a plan of backing out the changes, in other words, of aborting this action. So the way you think about recoverability, the, 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 the simple way to think about it is, is do it all or not at all. And our goal is to try to somehow come up with a way to achieve this goal. And before we get into a solution to this problem, there's a few other concepts um, to discuss. And they'll turn out to be very related to each other. And the second concept, after recoverability, that's very closely related to this idea, has to do with concurrent actions. So imagine for a moment that you had the same transfer procedure as, on, um, as in this example, but you had two transfers running at the same time and they happen to act on the same um, data items, like that. So let's say that the first transfer um, moved from a savings account to a checking account, it moved $100. And the second one moved from the saving to checkings, it mo checking, it moved $200. And let's say at the beginning, S was 1,000. Of course, as you recall from um, a few, several lectures ago, when you have these interleaved sequences, um, these two threads are running, these, the, the steps um, that these threads are made of might be interleaved in arbitrary order if you don't have a plan to isolate them. 
And in particular, you might have you know, many results that show up. And one result that might show up is both of these transfers running concurrently read the same, uh, you know, read 1,000 out from, from account. And then both of them debit by the right, by 100 and 200 respectively. So at the end of it, you might be left with uh, either $800 or $900 left in the account, when the right answer is to have been left uh, intuitively. If you ran both these transfers, you would like to see $700 left uh, in that account. Right? So what you intuitively want here is, if this is the first action, A1, and this is the second action, A2, what you would like to see is a sequence. You don't actually care what the order is between these two transfers. Right? I mean, you're transferring money from one account to another, and you're doing two of these. You don't actually care in this example, and it'll turn out in most examples, on all examples that we're going to be talking about um, um, in, with this notion, that you're not really going to care what the order is. Either order is perfectly fine, but the order should be as if it's equivalent to either A1 before A2 or A2 before E1, uh, before A1. And that's what we would like. Of course, the you know, a sort of naive way to achieve this is to ensure that exactly one action runs at a time, it finishes, and then the second one runs. But that's kind of going to be no fun for us to do. It's the right simple solution, but we're going to want to improve concurrency as we had wanted to um, you know, several lectures ago. So we're going to come up with ways of getting higher performance than running one after the other. But the net effect is as if you run it in some serial order, in some sequential order of the actions. Um, that is, the result of running uh, concurrent actions has to be the same as some serial ordering of the, of the individual actions. And this idea of A1 before A2 or A2 before A1 has a name. It's called isolation. And you should distinguish that in your mind clearly from recoverability. So a more precise definition of isolation is essentially what I said before. The equivalent, the, a composite sequence of steps is isolated if its effect from the point of view of its invoker is the same as if the action occurred either completely before or completely after every other isolated action. And the simple way to understand this is that you either do it all before or do it all after. That is, the net effect has to be the same as doing it all before or doing it all after. And it's different from recoverability, which is really do it all or not at all. Now, when you have a, a system that satisfies both recoverability and isolation. So the way to understand this is both of these really, although they're talking about different concepts, this is saying all or nothing, and this is saying all before or all after. Both of these are getting at the same intuitive idea, which is that somehow there's the sequence of steps in, um, for example, in this transfer procedure, there are the sequences of steps. And somehow you want to make it look as if for each action, um, the sequence of steps is not visible to somebody invoking the action. Right? Because you don't want the person invoking this action for recoverability. You don't want him to know that it's built out of a sequence of steps. And if a failure happens in the middle, you don't want the invoker of that action to see some partial state. Likewise, when you have concurrent actions running together, you don't want the different invokers of that action to somehow see this muddled result of the interleaving. You want them to only see the results of running these actions one after the other. So what you're really trying to achieve for both of these concepts, although they're distinct concepts, what you're really trying to achieve is to hide the fact that this action is a composite sequence of steps. You want to make it look as if it's quite monolithic. And this idea of wanting something to look monolithic is called atom atomicity. And we're going to basically be hiding the fact that it's composite. So more precisely, for this course, we're going to use the word atomic to mean recoverable and isolated. Okay, and I'm going to say for this course, because these terms have been um, in use in various different ways uh, for at least you know, probably more than 30 years. And I think it's about time we made these precise. So in the literature, you'll see the word atomic to often mean recoverable. And sometimes, and this is unfortunate, sometimes you'll see the word consistent to mean isolated. 
And in particular, you'll run into this confusion when you read the recitation paper for recitation on Thursday, the system R paper. Um, but we'll use the word. Uh, the problem is those terms are used, you know, historically haven't been used in a very precise way. So we'll define it precisely. When we say something is atomic, we mean, in general, we mean both recoverable and isolated. When we mean only one of them, we will say atomic with respect to recoverability or recoverable. Um, atomic with respect to isolation or isolated. And like I said, atomic means recoverable and isolated. And the general plan is to hide the fact that an action is built out of composite sequence of steps. Now, to add to this confusion of terminology, there are actually two other terms that um, are two other properties that you often want from actions, in addition to recoverability and isolation. And these two other properties are provided by many database systems, which are uh, you know, one of the most common users of these concepts, the uh, most common system that provides atomicity. Uh, one example is a database system. Now, many, many systems provide um, atomicity. For example, your, every computer does it in its instruction set. You often want your instructions to, from the point of view of the invoker of the instruction, be atomic. Um, so we're going to be designing techniques that in general operate across the whole range of systems. But database systems are of particular interest because uh, they're very common and they exercise these concepts um, to, to a high degree. And two other concepts that many systems provide, the first one is consistency. And it's unfortunate that the word consistency was previously used to some extent to mean isolated. So it's important not to get into that confusion. So in some old papers, when you see consistent, they, they, it's, you should really um, realize, you should realize that what they really are talking about is um, isolated, A1 before A2 or A2 before A1. But what we'll mean by consistency, and we'll get into this next week, is that there's some invariant for the application that's using, uh, often using at atomicity that's maintained. For example, in a, in a banking application, if you take the transfer examples, isolated means that you want the result to be as if uh, the transfers ran in some serial order. Consistent means that there might be a higher level notion that the uh, designer of this banking application uh, might have wanted, such as a bank might have a rule that says that at the end of each day, um, the checking account, every checking account should, be, uh, should have uh, an amount that's at least 10% of, of the corresponding savings account. Now, during the middle of the day, there might be individual, uh, you know, there might be individual actions that transiently violate that, that rule, but at various points, the designer might wish to ensure that the, um, you know, a rule like the cons that, that the checking account must have at least a certain amount of money, some fraction of the savings account. Or in some, you know, payroll application for a company, um, you know, they're, they're modifying the payroll and adding, you know, giving raises to various people, but they might have a rule that says that you can give whatever raise you want, but every manager must make at least 5% more than all of his or her uh, direct reports. So you might have a rule like that. All of these are application-level invariants that correspond to the consistency of the data that's being maintained in this example in a database. And uh, you can use database systems to provide these rules, these consistency rules. But that's different from isolation. Isolation just describes the serial ordering in which, oh, sorry, it just says that there has to be some serial, equivalent serial ordering in which things, things run. And the fourth um, property in addition to after recoverability, isolation, and consistency is durability. Durability basically says that the data should last for as long as, um, you know, it depends on the, it's an application-specific concept, but what it says is the data must last uh, for as long as some predefined um, duration. So, for example, you might store data in a database, and, you know, in many databases, you really want it to last, quote, forever. But in reality, nothing ever, it's very hard to make things last forever. Uh, so you might describe, define that the uh, data in this database must last for three years, and you work hard to preserve that. Or you might have an application that as long as the thread is running, you want the data to last. Uh, but after the thread um, is terminated, you don't actually care about the data. And that's a different notion of durability. But both of these have talk about the, the lifetime with which you want to preserve data. Okay, so now when you have a system that provides recoverability and isolation, that is atomicity, consistency, and durability, then we're going to call that a transaction. So a set of actions that have uh, an action that, uh, sorry, a set of actions that 
each of which is recoverable, that are isolated from each other, that has a notion of consistency and can achieve it, and where the data has durability, um, those actions are called transactions. And many database systems work hard to provide transactions, which means they provide all of these features. But it's certainly possible, and we'll look at many examples, where you can just design systems that have just recoverability in isolation. And we, we may not even worry about these other notions. And that's what we'll start with. We don't want to solve all of the problems at once. We'll start with the easier set of problems and then build from there. I don't know what happened there. OK. OK, so today and on Wednesday, our plan is to come up with ways of achieving recoverability. So that's what we're going to start doing. So the general approach for how we're going to achieve recoverability of modules is, and recall that the problem here is M2 fails and then M1 um, somehow discovers its failure, and then when it restarts, you don't want any partial state to be kept. So the general plan is to design modules to be fail fast. So you need a way to discover that things are not working, and that's the scope of the kinds of systems we're going to be dealing with. And then once um, the system's failure is detected and then you restart the system or it recovers, um, you run some kind of a repair procedure. This is in general, you run some kind of repair procedure um, that allows you to recover, allows the failed module to recover, and then it restarts. Where restarts means it allows um, M1 in this case, allows invokers to start running uh, on that system, on that module. So we're going to do this in three steps. The first thing we're going to do is to look at a very specific special case of this problem, which is um, realize that all of these things having to do with partial state occur because there's some state, once a, once a module has crashed, there's some state that it has remaining. So if it just recovered and started running again without doing something, then that partial state is visible to uh, the invoker of that module. Now, if the state were all volatile state, like in just you know RAM, for example, and a thread crashed, and if it was in its virtual memory and the thread crashed and it recovered, then you don't really have to worry about this because all of the state um, anyway has gone away. So primarily, we're worried about state that lasts uh, across failures. And concretely, um, an example of that concretely is state that, that's maintained um, on disk, just as a concrete example. So we're going to start first by um, obtaining a recoverable sector. But basically coming up with a scheme that allows us to do reads and writes of a single sector of a disk in a recoverable way. So we're going to define two procedures, a recoverable put that allows you to put stuff, write stuff onto a single sector of a disk, and a recoverable get that allows you to read stuff off of, off of a single sector of a disk in a way that um, is, is recoverable. And the, general, and the hard problem here is going to be that as the system's crashing, um, for a variety of reasons, bad data might get written on to a, base, to a sector. So if you just took a regular sector of your disk, um, you know, as this, you know, let's say that someone, you know, this, it's, the operating system is trying to write something into a disk sector, somebody turns off the power, and random stuff might get just written out onto the disk. And so when the system comes back up, the reader of that sector might get some garbage value some result of some partial write. So that's what we're going to try to avoid. So we'll do that first. And then what we'll do, and, mo uh, and, uh, and the, that's for next time, the, to complete the story, recoverability story, we're going to use this solution as a bootstrap, to, uh, as, as a building block for a more general solution. Because it's not going to be enough for us to just be able to read and write single sectors in a recoverable way. Because you know how many applications use only one sector of a disk? What you'd like to do is to make sure that you have a general solution that works across all of the data that's being written and read. So we're going to use that to come up with two schemes. The first scheme uh, is, uses an idea called a version history. And the second scheme. Um, uses an idea called log, logging, using logs. And both of these schemes have, uh, will turn out to be very general and useful and work, but both of these schemes basically will use um, this technique as a bootstrapping technique. 
Okay, and so we need a solution here anyway because we're going to build on that to develop a more sophisticated solution for the general case. And so today we're going to start with the special case, um, A, because it's a building block, and B, because it will turn out to show us a rule that we're going to religiously follow in coming up with solutions, uh, systematic solutions for these more general, uh, uh, to, to work in the most, more general case when you have more than one sector being read or written. So let's write out um, the assumptions and the model here for the solution. The first assumption we're going to make, since we're dealing with recoverability and not with isolation, we're going to deal with isolation next week. The first assumption we'll make is that there's no concurrency. And we'll come up with different solutions for dealing with people concurrently trying to write uh, the same sector. We'll also assume, um, and this is an assumption we'll revisit in a couple of weeks to show you how to actually um, achieve this goal, but we'll assume that there's no hardware failures. There's no hardware errors. So for example, and uh, the appendix to chapter eight, which we'll actually, we've ass we'll assign uh, for reading later on uh, in the semester, um, actually shows two methods, careful put and careful get, um, that actually deal with a variety of hardware problems. So for example, every sector has a, disk checksum, a sector checksum on it. So if you wrote bad data um, and something happened in the middle of that write, um, and then someone went back and read that sector, they would discover that it's bad because the checksum wouldn't match. Now the appendix to this chapter, 9b, has a more careful description of how you deal with a variety of errors so that you can achieve this careful put and careful get of a disk sector. So assume for now that there are no hardware errors, there's no decay of data on the disk and so on. It'll turn out the problem is still interesting, that it's not easy to achieve um, a recoverable put and get, even though the hardware is fine. And that's because there are software errors. And in particular, um, the model here is that you have some application, and then you have the operating system, and the operating system has a buffer here of data that it's waiting to write onto disk. Then you have a disk. And that's a disk sector. And the problem might be that if, when, as a failure occurs, there's something that happens, an error, something that gets triggered in the operating system, so the buffer gets corrupted, and then there's some bad data that gets written out onto this sector. And that's the kind of problem that we want to protect against. That's not, I mean, so the fact that your hardware is perfect doesn't actually solve this problem because this buffer itself has been corrupted, or something happens during the process of writing this buffer to the sector, so the data itself is bad. And that's what we want to protect against. So we're going to build on uh, something that I've already talked about. We're going to build on two procedures, careful put um, that puts to a sector, it puts some data, and the corresponding careful get, which reads from a sector and returns the data that's on that sector. And the assumption is that careful put and get, once you give it some data, there are no hardware failures for you to worry about anymore. So the solution we're going to take to this problem is to realize that when a failure happens, for example, somebody you know, turns off the power switch, and this buffer gets corrupted, when the operating system does a write to that sector, the sector might be left in a state which doesn't actually correspond to the data that was intended to be put onto that sector. And so when the system recovers, you're sort of stuck because this data in the sector contains some values in it that don't actually correspond to any actual um, intended uh, put of the data, any intended write of the data. So what this suggests is that a solution to this problem must involve a copy of some kind. You, may, you must make sure that if you have just one copy of the data and you write to it and something fails in the middle and you don't have a plan to back out to a, an earlier working version that was correct, you're stuck. 
So that suggests that we better have a solution that involves a copy of data. And later on, we'll see how to system systematically develop a rule based on this. So the, interior, the idea here is, is very simple. The way we're going to achieve a recoverable put and recoverable get of a sector is actually to build a sector, a single sector, a recoverable sector, out of three sectors. The first sector here is going to have one copy of the data. The second sector is going to have another copy of the data. And we're going to have a third sector here, which is going to act as a flag um, that allows us to choose one, one version or the other version. So let me call this D0. Let me call this D1, and let me call this the chooser. So assume that at some point in time, D0 has proper data on it. Okay. So the idea now is going to be that anybody reading it, the chooser is going to contain the value 0 in it. Okay. Now anybody reading is going to read from D0. Now anybody writing... Um, in recoverable put, is not allowed to write to D0, because that's what people are reading from. Instead, they will write to D1. When the chooser value is 0, they will start writing in to D1. The plan is going to be that if that write succeeds properly, then what we'll do is go ahead and change the chooser from 0 to a 1. Okay? And then people will start reading from 1. But if that write were to fail in the middle, so the power fails or something like that, D1 will be left in, a, in sort of a weird intermediate state. But that's OK, because nobody's really going to be reading from D1. They're all going to be reading from D0, because the chooser hasn't yet been changed. So the only other thing we have to worry about is, now we're OK. As long as the failure happens, you know, if the failure happens in the middle here, somewhere where we're writing D1, we're OK, because we haven't touched the chooser. If the failure happens at the end of writing D1, so we've written D1, and then we haven't yet started writing the chooser, and a failure happens here, we're still OK, because everybody will be reading from 0, and that isn't going to have garbage in it. It's not going to have the latest value in it, but that's OK. We never said that we should see the latest value um, for recoverability to hold. It's going to be OK for us to be reading from D0, and we'll continue to read from D0. And really, the correctness of this boils down to understanding what will happen when a failure happens during the middle of writing this sector. So you're starting to write the chooser sector, and the system fails. And we're going to have to worry about that, because now we've written D1 completely, and a failure happens in the middle of that. So to understand that, uh, we'll get back to understanding the correctness of it, but it helps to see what the pseudocode looks like. So that's what put looks like. Um, to do a put, you first read the chooser sector, and then you put into the other place. So this which here is the thing that tells you what the value of the chooser sector is. So it tells you which of the two um, copies to write into. And then after you do the um, careful put, if which is 0, you put it to 1. If uh, which is 1, you put it into 0. And after that, you twiddle the bit, and then you do a put onto, onto the chooser sector. And the get is actually easier. You just look at what the value is of the chooser sector and then um, get it from the corresponding place. Now, there's a line here, the second line of the pseudocode, which says if status not OK. So if status not OK is the key thing. If status not OK is what happens when a failure happens in the middle of writing the chooser sector. So let's say a failure happens on this pseudocode. Um, I already explained why there's no problem if a failure happens until you get to the last line until you get to the careful put of the chooser sector. Until that line is executed, nobody sees the new data. Everybody doing a get is continuing to see the old data, not the new data that just got written with careful put. After this careful put executes and returns, then everybody's going to see the new data because the chooser sector has been correctly changed. So the only tricky part to worry about, we've reduced this problem of the more general, slightly more general case of writing these sectors uh, and switching between them to the specific problem of figuring out what happens if a failure occurs in the middle of the chooser sectors, right? If failure happens here, one of the things, the common thing that could happen is that the disk sectors, this particular sector's checksum doesn't match the data that's written here. So when you do a get of that sector here, when you do a get of this sector um, in the first line up there, uh, when you do a careful get of that, you'll find that um, the checksum doesn't match, so it returns a status of not okay. 
So if the status is not okay, you have to figure out which of the two copies to put. Now the reason you can pick either, and you can arbitrarily pick, here I've arbitrarily picked to uh, read the data from sector zero, but you could pick either of these, okay? And the reason it's okay to pick either is, you know for sure that the failure must have happened here while writing this, chooser sector. And because there are no concurrent threads going on, you're assured that there is no failure that happens here while writing, that happened here while writing D0, nor was there any failure that occurred here while writing D1. Because the assumption we made was that there is no concurrency. So the system crashes and recovers and discovers that there's a failure, or the, the get of the chooser sector, the careful get of the chooser sector didn't quite work out, uh, didn't give you the, a status of okay, that it was not okay. Then you know that the failure happened while writing here. And what that means is it's perfectly okay for you to read from either version. Both of those correspond to a write to that individual sector that did not fail in the middle. And it doesn't matter which of the two you pick. And that's the reason why um, this approach basically works. And if you look at the solution, this copy idea is actually a pretty critical idea for all of our solutions to achieving uh, recoverability. And it's going to lead to a rule that we're going to call um, the golden rule of recoverability. And the rule says, never modify the only copy. So if you were asked to invent, to come up with a, recover, a way to achieve something that's recoverable, uh, you know, one guideline, this is unfortunately not a sufficient condition, but a necessary condition is that if you have something and you only have one copy of that that you end up writing, then chances are that if a failure happens in the middle of writing that general, that one copy, you can't back out of it. So your scheme wouldn't work. So never modify the only copy of anything. That's the general rule. Now, there's another point to uh, observe about this recoverable um, disk write, and that has to do with that careful put line. Right before that line, everybody else reading this recoverable sector using recoverable get sees the old version of data. Right after that line has finished, everybody reading it sees the new data. That line is an example of something that we'll uh, repeatedly visit uh, and use called a commit point. The successful completion of that line ensures that everybody else following doing gets will see the data that was written by this put. And before that line is run, everybody else following will see the, the older version of the data. Now, if a failure occurs in the middle of that line, then the answer depends on what the recovery procedure does. And one approach might be that the invoker of this module, the person who originally did the disk write, uh, if, a, if a failure happens in the middle of the write, one plan might be that the invoker of that disk write upon recovery tries the write again, uh, tries, the, tries the put again. And the way he tries the put is he first does a get and sees what answer is returned. If the answer is the new answer, then he says, okay, everything is fine. If the answer is the old answer, then he says, I'm going to retry the put. And this is an example of uh, something we saw the last time, which is temporal redundancy. You can retry things. You not only can you replicate in space, but you can retry things in time, which is the idea here for achieving uh, fault tolerance. So, so an example of this idea called a commit point is that line, that careful put line. And in general, a commit point is a point in a recoverable action in this case, and it'll turn out to be an idea that's useful for um, isolated actions and for transactions more generally. But a commit point is a point where before the commit point, other people don't see the results of your action, and after the commit point successfully finishes, everybody sees the results of your action, and that's the definition of a commit point. So now we have to generalize this idea, because what we've seen is a scheme. By the way, is this clear to everybody? Is this scheme, are there any questions about recoverable put and get? What does that mean? No questions or not clear? Oh, no questions. Okay. 
All right, good. So now we have to generalize this idea. Because you know, we're, the, the class of programs where you could just sort of read and write from one sector is quite limited. And so to generalize this, generalize this idea, what we're going to do is to change the programming model for writing recoverable actions a little bit. So ideally, what you'd like to be able to do, the, the model we're going to try to get at is to be able to take a procedure and say, begin recoverable action in front of that procedure, write the code for that procedure, and just say, end recoverable action, and sort of magically end up with a model where um, that action, the set of steps in that action, becomes recoverable. And it'll turn out we'll come very, very close to achieving this very general model um, by making some slight assumptions in the way people are requiring the programmer to make some small assumptions in the way they write uh, their programs. And this generalization to more general actions um, that are recoverable and uh, you know, generalizing from a single sector uses this idea of a commit point. So the way this is going to work out is the programmer is going to end up writing for any recoverable action, she's going, she or he is going to end up writing this special function call um, called begin recoverable action, and then writing the code for that recoverable action. And then at some point in the middle of this code, calling a function called commit. And the idea is that until this commit is called, nobody else sees the results of this action, which means that if a failure happened, the result would be as if the uh, upon crash recovery or uh, you know once the system restarts the result would be as if none of the steps of this action ever happened so they call commit and then once commit finishes then no matter what happens a failure could happen and re the system restarts but once commit is called and it returns then you're guaranteed that all other actions see the state changes made by this action and that's the you know so this is a special call and then you know after commit they might have some other lines that they write, and then they end the recoverable action. Now, in many, many cases, the very last thing that's done before, uh, before the end recoverable action is a commit. Um, but in general, you might have other things here. Uh, and it'll turn out that, there, that you can't do arbitrary things here. For example, you can't do uh, disk writes that you want to make recoverable over here. Because the moment you do that, by definition, if a crash happens after a commit, we don't have a plan to back out of it. Because the semantics were that once a commit is done, then no matter what happens, the state of the system is as if all of the um, things in this action finished. So the discipline is going to be, this thing is called the post-commit, the pre-commit phase. And this thing here is called the post-commit phase. And so the, the idea is that in the pre-commit phase, um, you should always be prepared, prepared to back out. Because by definition, if a failure occurs before commit, is called, um, the result's going to be as if nothing ever happened, which means that any change you make here, you better religiously follow that never modify the only copy rule and be prepared to back out. In the post-commit phase, conversely, you better make sure that you can never back, you, you, don't, you, know, you don't have the option to back out. So you better make sure that once you get here, you just run to completion. So if a failure occurs and in, out here and you restart, you better make sure that you can run to completion. In fact, there are a few other restrictions out in the post-commit phase. Um, so let me do this by an example. So in the pre-commit phase, you, because you have to be prepared to back out, it often means in practice that you can't be sending messages out onto the network. You can you know, maintain your local state, but you, know, you have a way to back out of that. Uh, but if you're sending messages out onto the network and you don't have a, you know, a, a bigger story to deal with it. You know, we'll talk later about um, nesting atomic actions within one another or nesting recoverable actions within one another in a few lectures from now. But in the simple model, if you do anything that you can't back out of, such as sending a network packet, then you're stuck. So all of that stuff, like you know, printing out checks or you know, sending a, firing a bullet or something, things like that that you can't back out of, you better put out here. All the things that you can back out of go here. Likewise, nothing you can back out of has to go, can go here. Because once you reach here and a failure happens, you have to continue to completion. What that means is in the post-commit phase, really, you can't do very many things. I mean, you can do things that don't really have um, 
um, you know, for example, you can do things that are okay to keep doing. For example, you can do idempotent operations so that if a failure happens here and you recover, then you know that you're out at this point, so you could keep retrying those actions over and over again until you ensure that it completes. But that's the only, those are the only rules. There's a pre-commit phase and a post-commit phase. There's a commit that's explicitly called. Now, in addition, there's another call that a, pro that a programmer can make or that the system can invoke automatically, and that's called abort. For example, when you're moving money from savings account to checking account in that transfer example, um, if you discover in the middle here that you don't have enough funds to cover that transfer, you could just decide to abort the transaction. Excuse me, abort the recoverable action. And what that means is that abort automatically will ensure that the state of the system is at the point right before the start of the recoverable action. So whatever changes were made in the middle until abort was called, um, end up backing out. Now, abort might also be invoked by the system if, you know, in a database system, there's somebody you're booking airline tickets and car reservations and all of that, and you discover in the middle that you're not actually able to find, you know, um, a hotel for the same dates. So you might just abort the whole process, you know, sort of control C, the thread you're running, uh, which means that all of the work that's been done has to be backed out, and so the system would normally implement that by aborting all of the changes that you've made um, so far. You know, it'll back out of your hotel reservation, it'll, I'm sorry, your car reservation, back out of your airline reservation, and so on. So abort is called in a few different contexts, sometimes by the program itself, sometimes by the system to free up resources, sometimes by the user of your, uh, for, say, a transaction system. So before I, uh, I'm not going to get into how we implement, um, you know, how we implement recoverable action today, uh, but, but this programming model is important to understand. I do want to mention one thing, going back to this idea of isolation that we talked about. So if you recall, isolation is this idea that you have two actions uh, or multiple actions whose net effect is as if they ran in some sequential order, some serial order, A1 before A2 or A2 before A1 for all, you know, permutations of A1, A2, A3, et cetera. Now, this idea is actually very closely related, but not the same as stuff we've seen before. You know, earlier in the semester, we looked at ways in which um, you, you have multiple threads that need to be synchronized with each other. And, you know, we actually did look at isolation as a concept then, but we specific, specifically focused on things like sequence coordination, where you want to have one thread run before the other thread or one thread, um, you know, run after the other thread, for example, in a producer-consumer uh, relationship. The point is that, in one significant respect, achieving this idea of isolation for actions is harder than achieving sequence coordination. And the reason it's harder is that everybody who writes an isolated action in general doesn't know, each, any given isolated action doesn't know what other actions there are in the system. So you might have you know, 25 different actions, all of which are touching the same data. But no single action is aware of all of these other actions. And that's very different from sequence coordination. In sequence coordination, you know, there's one or two or a small number of threads that are actually aware of each other. And there's a single programmer that's actually designing these things to specifically interact with each other in some fashion. So this thread runs, and then this other one runs after the data has been produced, and so on. So in that sense, this kind of isolation is a little harder, is, is harder to achieve because you want to do this, you know, each individual action doesn't know which other actions there are, but yet you want to achieve um, th this sequential goal. Now, in one other respect, actually isolated actions are easier than sequence coordination. And the way in which, the significant way in which they're easier is they're easier for programmers. Because we're not worried about coordinating different actions with each other, the programmers, once you design a system that does underneath, inside the system that deals with, you know, uh, ways of achieving isolation, the programmers don't have to think about locks and unlocks and, you know, acquiring and releasing locks or other ways in which they, um, um, they control access to variables that might be shared. So what this means is that if we can design isolated actions right, um, and we don't worry about any serial order, you know, A1 can run before A2 or A2 before A1, then it makes life a lot easier for a programmer. And our goal is to come up with ways of achieving recoverability and isolation that require very little from a programmer that wants these properties. So in a little, it's a little bit like pixie dust. You might write a general program, and 
come in and just put a begin recoverable action, end recoverable action, and make a few changes to your program, or you might just say begin isolated action, end isolated action, and magically the system achieves isolation and uh, recoverability for you. So it, it's, it's, uh, it can make life much easier for a programmer, but it is a harder problem for us because no single action is aware of all of the other actions in the system. So next time we'll see how to achieve recoverability and then isolation and transactions. Design Project 2 is out on the website now. And the main thing for you to make sure you do this week is get project partners uh, and send a list of team members to your teaching assistant by Thursday's recitation. Thanks.